Speaking of liberty, in the public interest, the National Broadcasting Company has made its facilities available for another program in the second series under the auspices of the Council for Democracy. Once again, there is a period of free talk on the air. Once again, our host is Rex Stout, who most of you already know as the author of the famous Nero Wolf detective stories. This week, another Rex Stout master detective makes his debut in a brand new mystery story entitled Alphabet Hicks. Clever, active as a dynamo, a little on the shady side, deliberately mysterious. That's A. Hicks, whose singular calling card, but read it for yourself. At this moment, we present not the author of Baffling Tales, but the outspoken champion of our American democracy, Mr. Rex Stout. Thank you, George Putnam. Good evening, friends of liberty. Our guest today, Erskine Caldwell, has recently got home from a long trip together with his wife, Margaret Burke White, the photographer. You read his books, God's Little Acres, Trouble in July, and others, and seen his famous Tobacco Road. But what we're interested in today is his trip. He went to Russia, and unlike the Germans, he got to Moscow. Not only that, he got there ahead of time, before it started. What was the date, Mr. Caldwell? When we got to the Soviet Union? Well, Moscow. The 12th of May. We landed in Hong Kong in April, then to Chongqing, through Mongolia, northwest China, Kazakhstan, and on into European Russia. Well, how was Hong Kong last April? Jittery? Well, worried. They knew the Japanese were getting set, and that it was only a matter of time until the showdown. When you got to Moscow, you made it a base for exploration? Not for a while, Mr. Stout. For a solid month, we didn't make any explorations. The Russian government had passed very strict laws forbidding any travel whatever, anywhere, in Russia by anybody. They finally made a special dispensation in our case, but it wasn't until the 12th of June that we even managed to leave Moscow. At that time, do you think anyone in Russia knew that the German attack was coming? The government knew, at least three months in advance. That was why they had passed laws forbidding travel. You see, the country had been overrun with Germans, so-called tourists, sightseers, and advance agents, and the laws were aimed directly at them. Well, what about the Russian people? Did they know? I don't think so. We were down on the coast of the Black Sea on June the 22nd, at a resort called Sahumi. For the first few hours, there was general confusion. People were in a daze. But by the next morning, all that had cleared off, and they were ready to face the fact of war. And three days later, the entire nation was mobilized. The entire nation in three days? Yes. It was one of the fastest mobilizations in history. Not only an army of 20 million men, but the entire nation. Did you say 20 million? That's right, Mr. Stout. Ten million in the standing army to meet the German attack, and another ten million in reserve. And those ten million reserves are still almost uncalled on back in the Urals. They are still being trained and equipped. But hadn't a large part of the army been mobilized near the frontier for months? I don't think so. What the Germans met at first was simply border guards that fell back for several hundred miles towards the Soviet main forces. They had a zone of fluid defenses in tremendous depth. That was a Russian answer to mechanized war. Seems to have been a pretty good answer. What did you find when you got back to Moscow? When my wife and I returned to Moscow on June the 28th, six days after the attack began, everything was perfectly organized. People were confident and busy. <coughs> Every citizen felt himself part of the mass mobilization resisting invasion. You could call it a total psychological mobilization for total war. And that brings up an interesting point, I think. The French failed in 1940 because their people weren't prepared psychologically. They still regarded the French army as a fighting force and saw themselves as citizens more or less unaffected. The Russians have held out against the German attack because they were prepared psychologically as well as other ways. For 20 years, their people have been trained to the t idea of total war. For 20 years, they have been working for the state and had, had it dent into them that if war did come, it would be total. Hell, we tried some dinning here, too, but of course in a democracy it's different. There's more than one din in a democracy, which is as it should be until the shooting starts. It was interesting the way the Russian people responded. The working day was lengthened from 8 to 10 hours, and the working week from 5 to 6 days. So they still had a day of rest. Yes, on Sundays. But almost immediately, people began donating that day of rest to the government without pay. It was done by groups. The people in a, in a block of apartment houses would report together for whatever work was assigned to them by the city Soviet. 
that would correspond to our mayor's office. Did all the people do that? Yes, they did. I talked with working men and artists and college professors, men and women, old and young. My secretary, for instance, spent her Sundays carrying bricks. Good for her. What do the Russians think about us Americans, Mr. Caldwell? Well, they don't know much about us, of course. I think they like Americans as well as any foreigners, perhaps better, and of course they have a tremendous respect for us. They admire our industrial organization and our technical ability to point of copying both whenever they can. And then they like us as people, too. I spent a great deal of time back to the front with various units of the Army, and they certainly went all out on hospitality. At every mess, they gave us a banquet, and when it came time to say goodbye, the final toast almost invariably was, of course in Russian, on behalf of my regiment and country, I am joining hands with you as a token of friendship between our two great nations. I'd drink to that myself. What about the Russians as a modern industrial nation? How good are they? Very good indeed, Mr. Stout. Apparently much better than the world at large had any idea of. I know what you have in mind. All those stories about how the Russians would never make any good industrial workers. Their temperaments weren't fitted for it. Yes, like the stories about the Japanese not making good flyers. I think the reason for that misunderstanding of the Russian worker was that we were judging the Russian industrial organization by what we could see of its results in the production of consumer goods alone. They weren't impressive, but we forgot that the main Russian effort all along was in the production of military and defense materials, and that we never saw. It was kept absolutely secret until the outbreak of war. Now we know that the Russians have done very well indeed. Their tanks and planes are as good as the Germans, and they apparently have plenty of them. But can they keep on producing them? I should say from my observations that they can, Mr. Stout, and that is one of the modern Russian miracles. Their industrial capacity has been cut down by the German invasion, of course, but not as much as you might think. We've heard a good deal about how they moved whole factories to the interior. They actually did it. Probably about 75% of their entire industrial capacity has been saved and transported bodily to the Euro. Sounds incredible. Imagine moving Pittsburgh to Denver in two months. What about the people, Mr. Caldwell? Did, did they go too? Only certain classes, Mr. Stout. Technicians, workers, and officials. The others all the population, have orders to remain in their homes or on their land until they get official orders to go somewhere else. There wasn't any great refugee problem in Russia as there was in France. And those left behind, or some of them, are they the guerrillas? Exactly. Every Russian citizen is trained in the use of arms and told just what to do in case he ever finds himself behind the enemy lines. Then the guerrillas aren't part of the regular Russian army. No. Not unless they are detachments that have been cut off in some military operation. There have been plenty of those, of course. But most of the guerrillas work, as we read about, burning supplies, destroying German equipment, attacking outlying posts. It's all the work of Russian peasants doing what they've been trained to do. You see, Mr. Stout, again, it's all a part of the picture of total war. Yes, the war we are now in ourselves. And that raises a question. What are the Russians going to do in the Far East, Mr. Caldwell? Do you think they will help us actively in our fight with Japan? I think it might help us if we examine Russia as a whole, Mr. Stout. We've seen a strong united people determined on defending themselves to the end. At the same time, we've seen a people somewhat suspicious of outsiders doing their own business in their own way. Right now, they're engaged in the greatest land battle of history with enormously long lines to cover and supply. Opening up a second front in the Far East would mean taking on another big job of huge dimensions. So then do you expect Russia to remain on the sidelines in the Pacific? Not necessarily. Russia needs American supplies, and that Pacific port of Vladivostok may still be a very important port of entry. It would be a great help to us to have Siberian bases. Up to now, Russia has preferred not to get involved with Japan, but that was before this morning. As matters stand now, in this all-out battle against the Axis, we need her and she needs us. Well, if she does decide to fight Japan, what has she got to fight with? Haven't a lot of the best Russian troops been moved to the other front? I saw Siberian troops in European Russia way back last June, and of course they've moved in a lot more since then. But I doubt if they've weakened their Siberian defenses very seriously.
Assuming that they have reduced the Sabine army by a third, they would still have better than a half a million men left, all well-trained and well-armed, and a complete force of fighters and heavy bombers as well as submarines. And they're where they can reach the Japs. I want to say one thing more, Mr. Stout, and that is this. The whole Far Eastern development has been simply a part of a gigantic world strategy of the Nazis. They timed the attack of their Japanese allies on the United States to fall when it could be of the best possible service to the Nazis themselves. And when they needed it most. Yes. As I see it, the German strategy runs like this. Distract America in the Pacific, which will have the effect of cutting down American aid to Russia and Britain, which will make possible a digging in on the Eastern Front. Then the Russians can be held in check with a comparatively small force while main German strength is directed elsewhere to a new assault in North Africa towards Suez or down through Spain and Portugal to Africa's west coast. And then across to South America and then north. Yes, but we must never let them get that far. No more defense for us. We must attack. The whole idea of mere defense must be abandoned or we cannot win. There's no or about it. Not anymore. Thank you, Mr. Caldwell. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest today, the last on this present series of broadcasts by the Council for Democracy, has been Erskine Caldwell, author and journalist whose new book on Russia will be published soon. This is Rex Stout saying goodbye for the time being. You have just heard the final program of a special series entitled Speaking of Liberty, brought to you in the public interest by the National Broadcasting Company, under the auspices of the Council for Democracy. The Council would like to know how you've enjoyed these broadcasts in which distinguished authors and journalists have been interviewed by Mr. Rex Stout. Please send your comments in a letter or a postcard to the Council for Democracy, 285 Madison Avenue, New York City. A copy of today's broadcast will be sent to anyone requesting it from that same address, Council for Democracy.